does Satan, my friends, why does Satan want to exalt his throne on the north side? Why on the north side? Brothers and sisters, hear me carefully. It is Satan's plan to interfere with the contact and the communication between Jesus and his people, between Jesus and the convicted sinner. Hear me. When the sinner was convicted of sin in the ancient sanctuary, in the ancient sanctuary, the Bible tells us the sinner was to bring a lamb, an animal, a sacrifice to the sanctuary in the outer court. And friends, guess where the sinner slew the lamb? Guess where the sinner confessed his sin upon the sacrifice, upon the lamb. Guess where the sinner met Jesus? Because the lamb typified whom? Christ. Where did the sinner meet Christ? Bring the lamb. It was on the north side. So when the Bible says that Satan desires to exalt his throne, but put it where? On the north. Side, He wants to interfere with the contact and the communication between Jesus and the convicted sinner, between Christ and his professed people. It's on the north side of the altar where Jesus first wants to meet us. What was the sinner to do before he slew the lamb? He was to do what? He was to confess his sin upon the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, if we don't confess our sins, known sins, will we be saved? Oh, friends, can death come at any time? Is human probation about to close? Is the man of sin, the paper say, Pope, is the wound all is the wound almost healed? So when must we confess our sins? It is now, and once the sinner confesses sin, what was he to do? Was the sinner to believe that God had forgiven him? Yes. yes. Did that sinner in the ancient sanctuary, did he hear God saying, I forgive you? Didn't hear that. But he believed by faith. And this is why it is called righteousness by faith. It's called obedience by faith. Faith, it's called being cleansed by faith. Faith cometh by hearing. And notice, it's not just called righteousness by faith. It's also called righteousness without works. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me, my friends? Ah, oh, beloved, when that publican came to the sanctuary and smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a what? A sinner. Did he sin? It's a possibility. He had some sins back home. Am I right or wrong? But the Bible says in Luke chapter 18, verse 14, Now I tell you, this man went down to his house, how? Justified. So my friends, in the temple he was declared how? Just without works. But did he confess? God be merciful unto me, a what? Sinner. But hold on. When he went home, what do you think he did? And guess what? Where does Satan want to put his throne? <laughs> on the north side of the altar. And what takes place on the north side? That's where the sinner Miss Jesus. That's where confession of sin takes place. That's where justification, oh friends, righteousness by faith, justification without works. That is where the sealing of God's people begins. That's where sanctification begins. And where does Satan want to put his throne? On the north side question friends so what does satan want to exalt on the north side where the sinner the convicted sinner meets christ his throne and what is linked to satan's throne he's a law so here comes the great question what is satan's law 
So where is the first place we find Satan's law? The first place we find Satan's command. The first place we find an instruction from Satan. Okay, what did Satan say to Eve in Genesis chapter 3? You can disobey God's throne, God's law, and you shall not surely die. I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north and behold we're friends uh, northward we're at the gate we're again off the altar north of the altar north of the altar this image of jealousy at the entry oh my friends and where was the sinner to bring the lamb where was the sinner to meet the type of that which typified Christ? North side of the altar. That's why I told you earlier, don't forget it. Do you see it now? And where does Satan, oh friends, the majority, the majority of God's ancient leaders of Israel who represent the majority of the apostate leaders today, where did they Establish this image of jealousy? Ah, oh, beloved. In the entry on the north side. In other words, my friends, the true experience of justification by faith has become void in the church. The true experience of righteousness without works, sanctification, the message and the experience of God's people being sealed have now been pushed outside of the church. The graven image has been erected in the church. What do you mean, pastor? Any minister, hear me carefully, any minister who preaches against jewelry, the wearing of jewelry from a biblical perspective, will not be allowed to enter certain churches because those churches, the elders and ministers, they wear wedding bands. They wear wedding rings. And unless you kiss this graven image we have set up, unless you bow to this image, our policy, our culture, our man-made tradition, you cannot enter. If some ministers preach and uplift health reform, you won't enter certain churches. You have to kiss their graven image. If some ministers preach against competitive sports, you will not be able to enter certain churches. You have to bow down, my friends, to their graven image. If you preach against the worldly music, if you reference uh, second selected messages, uh, page 36 uh, and Ephesians chapter 5 uh, and Colossians chapter 3, you will not be able to enter certain churches because they want to beat the drums and have the bass guitars and have carnival-like worship. Do you not see what's going on? They put it at the entry of the tabernacle. You have to honor this before you get through. Are you hearing me, my friend? Are you hearing God's spirit, my friends? Let's move on to dress. You dare not preach against dress deform. You dare not talk about health reform, uh, dress reform. You dare not talk about women wearing a pants without a covering. You dare not do that. Tight-fitted clothing splits all the way up. You see what I'm saying? And you're going to say, Pastor, you see, you're a critic. It's the word of God. Amen. Is there coming a time when it would, it would be called rebelliousness and rebellion, rebellion to preach against homosexuality in the church? Amen. Beloved, I, will not be, I would not be surprised if some of these women elders... Women pastors, hear me carefully, men elders, men pastors, men deacons, start coming out the closets. I would not be surprised. The Bible says uh, in Exodus chapter 32, verse number 6, uh, they ate, uh, they drank, and then it said what? They rose up to play 
What does that mean? Listen, in a book called Testimonies to Ministers, page 99, it's on your sermon notes, page 99 says, uh, and page 100, it says this, and they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. The Bible says uh, they drank and feasted and gave themselves up to mirth and dancing, which ended in the shameful orgies. I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised that before or during or after 2015 general conference session, we have an issue on the floor about homosexuals being installed as elders, deacons, pastors, even lesbians. I would not be surprised. I hope I'm wrong. But friends, prophecy has to be fulfilled. It's the same thing. Look at GYC. Gen generation for youth. Generation, youth for Christ. Look at GYC. Friends, when GYC began, it was a grassroots movement. It was a call for revival and reformation unto the powers that be. Said, who are you people down here? What are you talking about? The church needs revival and reformation. Huh? Who has sent you? Who has given you the authority to be holding these meetings? Well, look, if you want our recommendation, if you want peace, you better sign this document. And guess what? They looked at the document and the group leaders for GYC, and they weren't called GYC uh, Generation for Generation. Youth for Christ, they had a, separate, a different name. They read the stipulation, and guess what? They bowed and kissed the image. Mm. Yes? And who are the ones in charge now of GYC? Hmm? Who are the ones in charge? You see, friends, these are the things that will cause people to get agitated. But friends, it's the truth. It's the elephant in the room. GYC and other movements like it, ASI, oh friends, they have all been hijacked. But to speak about this, we hear, shh, don't talk about this. Or preacher, I'm going to send you an email. Pastor Henriquez, that's the truth. Keep preaching. But I can't talk about these things because I have a program to go to next Sabbath at this church. I must be on the television. I must get my name in the magazine. Talk about self-supporting workers, self-supporting ministries, even churches. If you are going to have our recommendation before you enter these churches, you must pass this graven image. <laughs> it's at the entry of the gate. You have to bow down to these stipulations. Do you remember what happened to David Gates? Elder David Gates. If you are going to enter these churches, you must kiss this graven image. Do we not see it? Do we not see it, my friends? Ezekiel chapter, Ezekiel chapter 8. Go back there, my friends. Where are we going to? And friends, I don't call names because I want to be critical. But I'm talking about the issues. And for all these years, our ministers have been speaking in parables. And Jesus says, I speak the parables to those who have eyes and what? See not. Are you telling me as Seventh-day Adventists, we have eyes and see not? Do you want a pastor in the last day to speak in parables to you? But Jesus says to my 11 or to my 12 disciples, I use not parables. I speak to you, giving you the straight testimony. Do we profess to be that close-knit group around Christ? If not, then guess what? You're in the world then. Then you need parables. Where is this thing heading? Not just the image in the church, but friends, is Satan going to establish the image of the beast in the world? 
is he, my friends? Revelation 13 confirms, but listen now, before Satan can move to establish the image of the beast in the world, we must see first bring the same sentiments of the image in the church. So once the church receive the spirit of the draconian image, then we will join in steps. Revelation 13, 1, and I stood upon the sand of the sea. We have been going through a series dealing with this power. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Verse number four. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And verse number six says, And he opened his mouth. In what, my friends? In blasphemy against God. Let's pause right there so we know who is this beast power. Huh? This, this leopard-like beast. Talk to me. This is Pope Ray. But for the record's sake, and for those who are joining us, let's analyze this. What's a beast in Bible prophecy? Huh? Come on. What's a beast in prophecy? A beast represents a nation. What scripture? Daniel chapter 7. Verse 17 and verse number 23. So this is a leopard-like beast, a nation. And what does uh, this nation do? The Bible says this nation blasphemes uh, God. Amen? And what is blasphemy? Come on, talk to me. A man who claims to be God. And a man who claims to be able to forgive sin. So which nation has a leader, a man, who claims to be God? It's Vatican City, the papacy, the popery. Which nation has a man or men who claim to be able to forgive sins? This is Vatican City. Last week I shared with you this article that we're seeing here on the screen. It says that the Pope of Rome, all the popes of Rome, including this present pope, Pope Francis has taken unto himself the title, the Vicar of Christ, which means the representative of Christ on the earth, which means he is God on the earth. That's blasphemy, that's sin. John 10, verse 30 through verse 33. Mark chapter 2, verse 5 through verse 7 also confirm that. But notice here, my friends, this is an article concerning George W. Bush, the former president of America. And this was on uh, uh, EWTN network. And notice what the question was posed to him. It says, finally, Arroyo, the anchor, asked George W. Bush, you said famously, when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. Now, when you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, the Pope's eyes, what do you see? And Bush answered immediately, I see God. This is blasphemy. Revelation chapter 13. Notice with me in verse number 7, are we there? The Bible says now, and it was given unto this nation, this leopard like beast, it was given unto him to make war with the saints. And to overcome them, and power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So this leopard-like beast, this system, Pope, the papacy, the Bible says it is a world leader. Is that clear, my friends? And the Bible says also that this nation made war with whom? The saints of God. Is it a historical fact? That from 538 through 1798, that the Roman Catholic Church persecuted God's faithful people? Is that a historical fact? Was that a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Yes, my friends, this is the power. Over 50 to 100 million souls were martyred and slaughtered. Go back to verse number 7. For the question is, 
This is not 1798. What year is it now? It's 2014. So the great question is, does the Bible prophesy that the Roman Catholic hierarchy, that this power will again rule the world? Does the Bible say, the papers say, Pope will again persecute God's faithful people, the saints of God? Yes. So my friends, the question is, what must Pope control as a sign that she's now taking over the world? Huh? Come on, we learned this la last week. Amen. She must control the wealth of the world. I'm so happy you went back to study. Amen. Daniel chapter 11. Where are we going to, my friends? Daniel chapter 11. And the paper said, we are told, oh, friends, it's like a chameleon. Camouflage. Pope the national son of the law, the mark of the beast. It is making its way in darkness. Daniel chapter 11, verse number 43. Are we there, my friends? And God has given to his people the prophetic light. Would you say amen? amen. The prophetic light uh, that we might not be in darkness, uh, but be children of the light. Uh, okay, may I quote this? We are told, my friends, uh, that ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith uh, of Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation should be carefully studied in connection with them the words. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Daniel chapter 11, are we there my friends? Verse number 43 says, But he shall have power over what friends? The treasures of gold. And of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Who is the he here? That will have power over all the wealth. Who is the he here? It is Pope. How do we confirm that, my friends? Where did we go last week? Huh? We look at verse 40. Thank you so much. Amen. Verse 40 says, And at that time, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south, that's not our focus now, the king of the south, push at him. And who, my friends? And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and with what, my friends? Many ships. Pause right there. So this is the king of the north, uh, the he that will control all the wealth. And friends, bear in mind uh, the word ships. Ships in the Bible are symbolic of what? Who remembers? Ah, wealth. Psalm 107, verse 23 confirms. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 14 also confirm that ships represent business. It represents finances. It represents the economy. And when the king of the north returns, the Bible says he will control what? The ships, the money power. The money power. But how do we confirm that this king of the north is the papacy? Firstly, we said, let's rehash what we went through. In the truest sense, who is the king of the north? It is Christ. What text say that? Psalm 48, verse 1 and verse 2. All right. But who does the Bible say is desiring to put his throne on the north side? Who is that? It is Satan, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to verse 14. And does Satan want worship that should only be given to Jesus Christ? Yes. So this is the infamous king of the north power. So considering what we have covered so far, which entity blasphemes God? Which entity has a man who claims to be God and compel people to pay him homage? When they come into his presence, they must bow down and kiss him and even kiss his hand with his ring. Who is this? It's Pope. So in the secondary infamous sense, the king of the north is home. It is Pope. Verse number 40, 43 once more. The Bible says in verse 43, 
But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians, which are symbolic of people in the last days, shall be where? Talk to me. Shall be where? Shall be at his steps. What does it mean that a large group of people will be at the steps of, of Popre when he gains control of, of the wealth of the whole world? They will have that same spirit of whom? Of Popre. And from where, from whom did Popre receive its spirit? From the dragon power. What text say there? No. Good try. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Where are we going to, my friends? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Mark your Bibles, my friends. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible puts it this way now. At its steps means you have the same power of popery. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 18. Are we there, my friends? Are we there? The Bible says now, the Bible says now, I desire Titus and with him, I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same what? Spirit. Walked we not in the same steps. So my friends, when Popery controls the wealth of the world again, the Bible says a group of people will be where? At his steps. They will have the same spirit satanic spirit of popery and revelation chapter 13 says my friends a day is going to come he will cause the image of the beast to speak to speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what should be killed and he calls both, both, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive what? To, oh, my friends, to receive a mark that no man might what? Buy or sell except they what, my friends, receive this. So, my friends, follow me now. Our people, sadly to say, will be at the steps of popery. Are people going to receive the same spirit that actuates, motivates, inspires popery? That same draconian spirit. Now watch the question. What will cause the professed people of God to receive that same spirit? Hear me carefully, friends. In the book, The Great Controversy, page 608 says, As the storm approaches... A large class who have once professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, will abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world, again I say, by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit they have come to view matters in nearly the same light and when the test is brought they are prepared my friends to choose the easy and the popular side revelation chapter 13 where we're going to my friends Revelation chapter 13, notice with me in verse number 3, the Bible says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was what, friends, was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. So what will the world be doing when the wound of Popery is being healed when the papacy is about to rule the world again and then persecute God's faithful people. What will the world be doing, friends? Wandering after the beast. I wonder what does it mean to wander after the beast? To admire the beast, admire Popery. Revelation chapter 17. Where are we going to? Revelation chapter 17. Verse number 6 says, And I saw the woman, 
drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered, that's the word, I wondered with what, friends? With great admiration. The question is, my friends, are the people, the majority of the people in the world wondering and admiring the Pope of Rome? especially the present Pope. We all said yes. We are all correct. Do you know what this means? It means the wound is almost fully, completely healed. And what will take place when the wound is completely healed? Huh? What will take place, my friends? The mark of the beast will now have been enforced. And then fines first will be imposed upon God's true faithful people who refuse to bow. And after fines, they will say, if we are still stubborn, then will come imprisonment. They are going to throw some of us in prisons. And if we keep on remaining faithful, then my friends, they're going to put us on the guillotine block. Persecution, Revelation 13. But don't be fearful, friends. Don't say, oh, Lord, I'm going to... Oh, no, 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 no. God has not given to us the spirit of what? Fear, my friends. And if God chooses to allow some of us to die the death of a martyr, guess what? He will then give us the spirit of the martyr, the faith of the martyrs. So my friends, in other words, God will give us all the strength that is needed to make it through these last days. The great question is, are you abiding under that secret place of the Most High? Revelation 13 verse 11, And I beheld the lamb-like beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and spake how as a dragon... And he exerciseth all the power of the witch beast, first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Notice here, my friends, Time Magazine, Pope Francis named what? Times, person of the year in 2013. Pope Francis, next article, wins Facebook, popular pontiff, tops worldwide trending topic list. Pope Francis tops Facebook's list of the most talked about topics. Listen, oh, let me run past that one. Pope Francis on Twitter, at Pontifex. Account blowing up as new pope asserts what, my friends? Uh, social media presence. Next article, Pope Francis' Instagram account poised, read with me, to take over the social media. Listen, President Obama, to meet the pope, he quotes what? Oh, he admires Pope Francis. Is the world wondering and admiring the Pope, my friends? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Because many people are saying, Pastor, do you really believe that? Look at the, look at the Roman Catholic Church. There's so much for the poor. Huh? Help with immigration. You mean, you, you mean... That church, yes, the Bible says, it's a leopard-like beast. Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Or the leopard is what? Spots. Then may you do good, Jeremiah 13, 23, who are accustomed to do evil. It means us no good, my friends, this entity. And many people are saying, but no, pastor, Pope Francis, he has transformed the face of the Roman Catholic Church worldwide. How could this be the entity? Look what this says. It says, Time Magazine, we're coming to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Pope Francis, the people's what? The people's Pope. It says now, 
Pope Francis Garner's, what's that word, friends? Admiring attention from non-Catholics. January 24, 2014. Watch this. It says Pope Francis named Person of the Year by leading gay rights magazine. Friends, are the world, the people in the world, wondering and, and admiring the present Pope? More than all the previous popes. Yes, my friends, watch this now. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Are we there, my friends? Are we there, my friends? The Bible says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves. What's that word again? You see, friends, oh, but Pope Francis, he's transforming the face of the Catholic Church. It was once an inclusive, pardon me, an exclusive entity. But now, friends, he's saying everybody is included. He once said, Pope Francis just said, if you are a practicing, you know where I'm going. All right. A practicing, all right. Okay, you got the point, amen. All right, if you practice this way, and if you just say you believe in Christ, you shall be saved. That was his implication. It's right here on the screen. Here it is. On Gay Priest, article, New York Times, on Gay Priest, Pope Francis asked, who am I to judge? <laughs> this church that was once exclusive is now what? Inclusive. He has transformed the face of the Roman Catholic Church more than all the previous popes, my friends. The Bible says now, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is what, friends, transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if Satan's ministers also be what? Transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. My friends, what word is used over and over again in those three verses? Transform is that going on right now, my friends. So while the world is wondering and admiring the Pope of Rome, calling the Pope Mr. Wonderful. Who should we now be wand wondering after? Who should we now be admiring? Who should we, we now be wondering after, my friends, and calling Mr. Wonderful? It is Jesus Christ. Go back with me to Isaiah chapter 14. Where are we going to, my friends? Now, beloved, if you, if you had tuned in, this past Thursday, and, and our online Bible study, some of these things we went over. If you were here last Sabbath, we touched on these things, but now we're entering now deep spiritual waters. Are you ready? Are you ready, friends? Isaiah chapter 14. Where are we going to, my friends? Isaiah chapter 14 now. Notice with me, if you were sleeping, wake up. <laughs> If your minds were somewhere else, come on, get focused. Isaiah chapter 14, are we there? The Bible says now in verse number 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will do what? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my what? My throne above what? Above the stars of God. I will sit also. Sit. That is throne. I will exalt my throne. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. We are my friends. In the sides of the north. I will be like the most high. Let me see if you are following me. What does Satan desire to exalt? His throne. Who sits on thrones? Kings. And where does Satan want to put his throne? In the sides of the north. We can switch those words and say, Satan, watch this. He wants to put his throne in the north side. Go to Leviticus chapter 1. I wonder why. Why does Satan want to establish, exalt his throne above the stars of God? 
in the church, in the congregation. Why does Satan, my friends, why does Satan want to exalt his throne on the north side? Why on the north side? Brothers and sisters, hear me carefully. It is Satan's plan to interfere with the contact and the communication between Jesus and his people, between Jesus and the convicted sinner. Hear me. When the sinner was convicted of sin in the ancient sanctuary, in the ancient sanctuary, the Bible tells us the sinner was to bring a lamb, an animal, a sacrifice to the sanctuary in the outer court. And friends, guess where the sinner slew the lamb? Guess where the sinner confessed his sin upon the sacrifice, upon the lamb. Guess where the sinner met Jesus? Because the lamb typified whom? Christ. Where did the sinner meet? Christ. Bring the lamb. It was on the north side. So when the Bible says that Satan desires to exalt his throne, but put it where? On the north. Side, He wants to interfere with the contact and the communication between Jesus and the convicted sinner, between Christ and his professed people. It's on the north side of the altar where Jesus first wants to meet us. You watch Leviticus chapter 1. We're in the sanctuary. You all thought we were finished with the sanctuary, right? No, my friends, the sanctuary runs all throughout scripture. We can talk about end time prophecy and the end time prophecies must bring us back to here into the sanctuary. Would you say amen? amen. Leviticus chapter one, verse number nine. Are we there? Oh, let me skip on down to verse number 10. The Bible says, and if his, verse 10, Leviticus chapter 1, verse 10, and if his offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or of the goats for a what? Burnt sacrifice. The Bible says, my friends, he shall bring it a male without blemish and he shall do what? Kill it on the side of the altar weir. North word, friends, underscore that. Do not forget the sinner brought the lamb, slew the lamb. We are my friends on the north side of the altar. Do not forget that. But it's Satan's plan to put his throne where? On the north side. Because that is where the convicted sinner was to bring what? The lamb. Was to meet whom? Jesus, because the lamb typified Christ. When the sinner brought the lamb, what was the sinner to do before he slew the lamb? He was to do what? He was to confess his sin upon the lamb. Brothers and sisters, if we don't confess our sins, known sins, will we be saved? Oh, friends, can death come at any time? Is human probation about to close? Is the man of sin, the paper say, poor pray, is the wound all is the wound almost healed? Ah, uh, friends, is the mark of the beast about to be enforced? Uh, that simply means then uh, the judgment God is about to investigate us, uh, our cases, along with uh, announcing. Declaring a verdict on our cases. Are you ready for this, my friends? So when must we confess our sins? It is now. And once the sinner confesses sin, what was he to do? Was the sinner to believe that God had forgiven him? Yes. yes. Did that sinner in the ancient sanctuary, did he hear God saying, I forgive you? Didn't he hear that? But he believed by faith. And this is why it is called righteousness by faith. It's called obedience by faith. It's called being cleansed by faith. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. If any man confesses sins, he's faithful 
and just to forgive us of our sins. Oh, friends, and do what? And to cleanse us of what? How many sins? Of all unrighteousness. It's called righteousness by faith. We confess our known sins. So, friends, what must we do now? If we want to by faith, if we want by faith uh, to believe, uh, right now God sees us clean, what must we now do? Huh? Confess our sins. But can we confess what we do not see? No, my friends. So when must we confess? Huh? It's Christ convicting us. Uh, it's Christ saying, my son, my daughter, I want you to search your heart. Yes, my friends. And notice, it's not just called righteousness by faith. It's also called righteousness without works. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me, my friends? Ah, beloved, when that publican came to the sanctuary and smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a what? A sinner. Did he sin? It's a possibility. He had some sins back home. Am I right or wrong? But the Bible says in Luke chapter 18, verse 14, Now I tell you, this man went down to his house, how? Justified. So my friends, in the temple he was declared how? Just without works. But did he confess? God be merciful unto me, a what? Sinner. But hold on. When he went home, what do you think he did? <laughs> now, he was walking in the strength of that forgiving word. In the strength of the word. I believe he went home and took the liquor that was on the shelves. And, oh, friends, you got the point. He took the pork chops, the shrimp and crabs, and put those things where? Now, I hope you got the point. For most of us, that's not our weaknesses. What are your weaknesses? Huh? But friends, it's justification without works. But he gives us power now to be obedient. Do you see, my friends? Because once that sinner brought the lamb, the Bible tells us, my friends, that that sinner, not only did he confess his sins and receive pardon by faith, the Bible says he had to cut out all the fat. And what is fat a symbol of in the Bible? So how much fat should we cut out? All the fat, my friends. So when we confess our sins, Christ wants to give us power to not only confess, but to forsake the sins. Would you say amen? amen? This is the experience God has for us. And then that sinner, friends, was to now wave the breast. The breast had to be what? Waved before the Lord. And what is the breast a symbol of? The heart. But Proverbs 23, verse number 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Do we think with this thing in our chest? We think with our minds. We must give God our minds, my friends. And watch now, what will God do when we give him our mind? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What will God do with our mind? Hebrews 10, 16. Oh, friend, this is the covenant, he says. After those days, I will make with them, saith God. I will write my laws into their hearts. In their minds will I what? Write them. Do you see it, my friends? That is the sealing. And guess what? Where does Satan want to put his throne? <laughs> On the north side. Of the altar and what takes place on the north side. That's where the sinner meets Jesus. That's where confession of sin takes place. That's where justification, oh friends, righteousness by faith, justification without works. That is where the sealing of God's people begins. That's where sanctification begins. And where does Satan want to put his throne? On the north side. What does he want to put there? Come on, uh, watch now. Let's learn something else now. What does Satan want to put on the north side? His throne. What is the throne connected to? 
before worship. It's a law. Go to Psalm 94. Where are we going to, my friends? Psalm 94. Some of you who were in Bible class a few Sabbaths ago, that question you should have answered readily and quickly because we did touch on that. Amen. Notice now, friends, in Psalm 94, where are we going to? Psalm 94, it is Satan's plan, the Bible says, to establish, to exalt his throne on the north side. And what is connected to Satan's throne? The Bible says it's a law. Verse 20, are we there? Together, friends, come on what it says. Shall the throne of iniquity have what, my friends? Have fellowship with thee, which freemeth mischief by a what? Mischief by a law. Question, friends. So what does Satan want to exalt on the north side where the sinner, the convicted sinner meets Christ? His throne and what is linked to Satan's throne? He's a law. So here comes the great question. What is Satan's law? Huh? Would you agree with me? The word law and commandment are synonymous. The word law and command are synonymous. The word law and instruction is syno are synonymous. Would you agree? So where is the first place we find Satan's law? The first place we find Satan's command. The first place we find an instruction from Satan. Okay, what did Satan say to Eve in Genesis chapter 3? You can disobey God's throne, God's law, and you shall not surely die. So when the sinner meets Jesus on the north side, Christ's law, Christ's command, Christ's instruction, if any man confess his sin, I am willing to what? Forgive and to cleanse. But Satan says, oh no, you can disobey God and you shall not surely die. Oh, do you see it, friends? Do you see it? It is spiritualism. Notice what this says. So friends, if we believe that we can hold on to any known sin, search your heart now, friend. Search your heart now. If we believe that we can hold on to any known sin and believe still that we can be saved, it simply means that Satan's throne is established in your heart. That is Satan's throne. We think, oh, Satan wants to establish his throne on the north side as if it's something just abstract. No. He wants to put his stone weir in your heart. Because think about it. Does Jesus have a throne? What is the foundation of Christ's throne? The law of God. And where does Christ want to put his law? In our minds, my friends. So where does Satan want to put his laws? Oh, friends, do you see it? If you see it, say amen. amen. Listen to steps to Christ. Page 32 says, sin, however small it may be esteemed, can be indulged in only at the peril of infinite loss. What we do not overcome will overcome us and work out our destruction. Listen, Adam and Eve persuaded themselves that in so small a matter, as eating of the forbidden fruit, there could not result such terrible consequences as God had declared. Some of us are saying we can hold on to some little darling sins. No, my friends, listen. But this small matter was the transgression of God's immutable and holy law, and it separated man from God and opened the floodgates of death and untold woe upon our world. Age after age, there has gone up from our earth a continual cry of mourning. Is that the truth, friends? Is that the truth, friends? 
And the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain as a consequence of man's disobedience. Heaven itself has felt the effects of man's rebellion against God. How did heaven feel the effects? Listen, Calvary, Calvary stands as a memorial of the amazing sacrifice required to atone for the transgression of God's divine law. Let us not regard sin as a trivial thing. Say that with me. Let us not regard sin as a trivial thing. One more time, friends. Let us not regard sin as a trivial thing. Ezekiel chapter 8. Where are we going to, my friends? Ezekiel chapter 8. So again, friends, let's make sure we're on the same point. So where does Satan want to exalt his throne? On the north side. Why on the north side? Huh? Because that is where the convicted sinner meets Jesus. That's where confession, that's where justification by faith without works, that's where sanctification begins. That's where the sealing of God's people begins. Uh, notice now in Ezekiel chapter 8, oh my friends, when you see this, you're going to say God is marvelous to have exposed the devil's tactics. Now we must pray, dear God, help me to say yes to you and no to sin. Ezekiel chapter 8, look at verse 3 with me. The Bible says, And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me, that's Ezekiel, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to where, friends? To Jerusalem, to where now? To the door of which gate? The inner gate that looketh toward where? The north. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh God to jealousy? Pause. So where was the seat? A seat and throne synonymous. Huh? A seat and throne synonymous. Satan says, I will exalt my throne and I will sit. A seat and throne synonymous. Yes, they are. And the Bible says, the seat of the image of jealousy. That provokes God to jealousy. Where was it placed? Friends, talk to me. Don't just say on the north side. We're inside the inner gate. On the north side. In the church. Look at verse 4. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, Ezekiel, lift up thine eyes now. The way toward the south. Is that what it says? No, the way toward where, friends? The north. So I lifted up mine eyes, the way toward the north. And behold, we're friends, uh, northward we're at the gate, we're again, of the outer, north of the outer, north of the outer. This image of jealousy at the entry. Oh, my friends. And where was the sinner to bring the lamb? Where was the sinner to meet the type, that which typified Christ, north side of the altar? That's why I told you earlier, don't forget it. Do you see it now? And where does Satan, oh friends, the majority, the majority of God's ancient leaders of Israel who represent the majority of the apostate leaders today, where did they Establish this image of jealousy? Ah, oh, beloved. In the entry on the north side. In other words, my friends, the true experience of justification by faith has become void in the church. The true experience of righteousness without works 
sanctification, the message and the experience of God's people being sealed have now been pushed outside of the church. Listen, they did not install the image of jealousy. No, they installed an image. That image drove Jesus to jealousy. So the question is now, what image causes Jesus to be jealous? Are you following me now? Huh? So the second commandment of the innocent. So now, when we go to Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 4, Verse number five, the second commandment says, now Jesus says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Then he says, do not bow down to them. Do not serve them. Then Christ said, now in verse five, for I am a jealous God, visiting what, my friends? The iniquity. So beloved, if we see that a symbolic, the true application of the image, the graven image, has now been installed in the church. It means that Jesus is about to visit the world, his church, with punishment. Sad, my friends. So now, let's study now. Let's study. Let's study. Where do we find in the book of Exodus, God's professed people erecting a graven image? At the base of Mount Sinai, they erected a graven image. The Bible says, go to Exodus 32 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Exodus 32, the Bible says, my friends, that Aaron used a graven tool. He made a graven image of the golden, the molten calf. And friends, what type of things went along with the golden calf? What type of things went along with that graven image? Because those things, the Bible says, causes Jesus to be jealous. And in addition to that, those are the things that rob you of the true experience of justification, sanctification, and to be sealed by God. The Bible says, my friends, in Exodus chapter 32, verse number 1, verse number 2, verse number 3, they had on jewelry, wedding bands, wedding rings, earrings, nose rings, all of it, my friends, all of it. The Bible, not, and friends, please understand the spirit. It's not to condemn because some people, they are tears because of false teaching. But it makes no sense in these last days for us to sugarcoat things, my friends. We must call, oh friends, God calls for men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their innermost souls are, are true and honest. Men who will not be afraid to call sin by its right name. The greatest one of the world is the want of these men. Men who will not shrink from the challenges, though the heavens fall. Notice, my friends, in verse number 5. Verse 6 says, they were eating and drinking. Nothing is wrong with eating and drinking. That means they were eating and drinking things that were abominable in God's eyes. Verse number 6 says, they rose up to play. Underscore those words. They rose up. To play. That means in the church back then, they had a certain type of entertainment that Jesus says those things drove him to jealousy. Question, friends. Why would Christ say those things make me jealous? It's because we should be married to Jesus. It's because we must make him first. And many of us, we have made gods of these things. How do we make gods of these things? We put them first before Jesus. That's why he's jealous. We would rather please our gut, our belly, 
and our taste buds than to honor God's word as it relates to diet. The Bible says, my friends, right now in verse number 7, verse 8, verse 18, verse 19, that they had worldly music in the church. These things went along with the graven image. The Bible says now in verse 19, they were dancing. Dancing, my friends. The Bible says now in verse number 24 and verse 25 that they were naked. They dressed scantily, scantily clothed. My friends, they did not follow dress reform. Do you see that? And then, my friends, Christ came to them. In love, Jesus said, now, Moses, give them one last opportunity. Who is on the Lord's side? Just stand. Amen. That's it. And the Bible says, my friends, over, over 2,300, where am I? The Bible says, my friends, in, 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 in verse 28, about 3,000 men. The people were rebellious still, even though they had an opportunity to surrender. In other words, they were rebellious. Beloved, are these things going on in the church right now? Are these things going on in the church right now? So are we to be silent? Huh? And I guarantee you, friends, when we talk about these things, people say, oh, that pastor, he's just critical. Who does he think he is anyway? Look how arrogant he is. My, my friends, hear me carefully. I was laughing a few days ago. When God brought back to my mind, Jesus was the one who said, people, his own people. Christ said, John the Baptist came and he was preaching. And John came not eating and drinking or fellowshipping with you. And you all said, John had a devil. You didn't listen to him. And the son of man has come. He's now eating and drinking with you. And you called him a wine bibber. <laughs> ah, friends, if you come straight, they say you have a devil. If you preach in parables, they won't listen. <laughs> Do you see it, my friends? But we are told in Testimonies, Volume 1, and Gospel Workers, God is calling for individuals, messengers, who will bear a still more pointed testimony than that was born by John the Baptist. John told Herod, he called him by name, Herod, leave Philip's wife alone. And we must give a more pointed testimony. And friends, even if you preach in love, they're going to say you have a devil. Friends, follow me now back to my point. Have you ever seen some heathen temples? Where at the entry of these either heathen temples, they have graven images. Yeah. Follow me. And before one can enter the sanctuary, the temple, you must first kiss. You must first bow down, whatever. You must first honor that graven image before you can enter the temple, enter the sanctuary. Friends, that's what is going on now. The graven image has been erected in the church. What do you mean, pastor? Any minister, hear me carefully, any minister who preaches against jewelry, the wearing of jewelry from a biblical perspective will not be allowed to enter certain churches because those churches, the elders and ministers, they wear wedding bands. They wear wedding rings. And unless you kiss this graven image we have set up, unless you bow to this image, our policy, our culture, our man-made tradition, you cannot enter. If some ministers preach and uplift Health reform, you won't enter certain churches. You have to kiss their graven image. If some ministers preach against competitive sports, you will not be able to enter certain churches. You have to bow down, my friends, to their graven image. If you preach against the worldly music, if you reference second selected messages, 
page 36 and Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3, you will not be able to enter certain churches because they want to beat the drums and have the bass guitars and have carnival-like worship. Do you not see what's going on? They put it at the entry of the tabernacle. You have to honor this before you get through. Are you hearing me, my friend? Are you hearing God's spirit, my friends? Let's move on to dress. You dare not preach against dress deform. You dare not talk about health reform, uh, dress reform. You dare not talk about women wearing a pants without a covering. You dare not do that. Tight fitted clothing, split all the way up. You see what I'm saying? And you're going to say, Pastor, you see, you're a critic. It's the word of God. Amen. Now, friends, you might not be where you ought to be, but that doesn't change the word of God. Amen. You must see the standard, the, 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 the bar, the bar, the bar, and ask Jesus for strength to rise up and meet the bar. To meet the standard. You dare not talk about these things, my friends. I want to ask you a question. Is there coming a time when it would, it would be called rebelliousness and rebellion, rebellion to preach against homosexuality in the church? Yes. Beloved, I, will not be, I would not be surprised if some of these women elders... Women pastors, hear me carefully, men elders, men pastors, men deacons, start coming out the closets. I would not be surprised. Friends, am I putting things out of the mid-air here? I want to show you something. Go back to Exodus 32. Oh, friends, when you see this, you're going to realize God is talking to us. The Bible says uh, in Exodus chapter 32, verse number 6, uh, they ate, uh, they drank, and then it said what? They rose up to play. What does that mean? Listen, in a book called Testimonies to Ministers, page 99, it's on your sermon notes, page 99 says, uh, and page 100, it says this, and they rose up early on the morrow, and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. The Bible says they drank and feasted and gave themselves up to mirth and dancing, which ended in the shameful orgies. That went along with the graven image. No, I would not be descriptive. You understand what that means. I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised that before or during or after 2015 general conference session, we have an issue on the floor about homosexuals being installed as elders, deacons, pastors, even lesbians, I would not be surprised. I hope I'm wrong. But friends, prophecy has to be fulfilled. It would make sense if we read the prophecy and realize the Bible says these things will take place. Dear God, it has to come to pass. Help me not to be the one doing it. Help me not to be the one supporting it. Are you hearing God today, my friends? It's the same thing. Look at GYC. Gen generation for youth. Generation, youth for Christ. Look at GYC. Friends, when GYC began, it was a grassroots movement. It was a call for revival and reformation unto the powers that be. Said, who are you people down here? What are you talking about? The church needs revival and reformation. Huh? Who has sent you? Who has given you the authority to be holding these meetings? Well, look, if you want our recommendation, if you want peace, you better sign this document. And guess what? They looked at the document and the group leaders for GYC, and they weren't called GYC uh, generation for generation. Youth for Christ, they had a, separate, a different name. They read the stipulation, and guess what? They bowed and kissed the image. Mm. 
Yes. And who are the ones in charge now of GYC? Hmm? Who are the ones in charge? You see, friends, these are the things that will cause people to get agitated. But friends, it's the truth. It's the elephant in the room. GYC and other movements like it, ASI, oh friends, they have all been hijacked. But to speak about this, we hear, shh, don't talk about this. Or, preacher, I'm going to send you an email. Pastor Henriquez, that's the truth. Keep preaching. But I can't talk about these things because I have a program to go to next Sabbath at this church. I must be on the television. I must get my name in the magazine. Talk about self-supporting workers, self-supporting ministries, even churches. If you are going to have our recommendation before you enter these churches, you must pass this graven image. <laughs> it's at the entry of the gate. You have to bow down to these stipulations. Do you remember what happened to David Gates? Elder David Gates. If you are going to enter these churches, you must kiss this graven image. Do we not see it? Do we not see it, my friends? Ezekiel chapter, Ezekiel chapter 8. Go back there, my friends. Where are we going to? And friends, I don't call names because I want to be critical. But I'm talking about the issues. And for all these years, our ministers have been speaking in parables. And Jesus says, I speak the parables to those who have eyes and what? See not. Are you telling me at Seventh-day Adventist we have eyes and see not? Do you want a pastor in the last day to speak in parables to you? But Jesus says to my 11 or to my 12 disciples, I use not parables. I speak to you, giving you the straight testimony. Do we profess to be that close-knit group around Christ? If not, then guess what? You're in the world then. Then you need parables. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 8. We're going to my friends. But, and some of these things are somewhat humorous, but it's the truth. Where are we going to, my friends? Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13. Oh, my friends, where are all these things leading? I must close now. Where are all these things leading? Ezekiel chapter 8 says, once the image was installed that moved God to jealousy, once that image robbed God's people of the true experience, God became how? Jealous. And then he brought on visitation of judgment. Do you know what happened next? The people then turned their backs to the temple of God and turned their face toward the east. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. I was speaking to someone this past week. I said, brother, do you really believe that Pastor Enriquez is doing anything good? I feel like I'm like a man by the, a large ocean and just throwing pebbles <laughs> in the water. I, I don't know what effect this thing is having. This thing is having. But what I do know is, selected messages, book one, page two or four says, this new organization, nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. I don't care how many of us preach it in love. They would not allow anything to stop their new organization. And they would love to point at us and say, we have left the church. We have started a new church, a new conference, a new organization. When friends, it's apparent they have begun. Am I saying it's we against them? Friends, we are all one family. All one family. But the truth must be told. Some will hear, others will what? Forbear. Where is this thing heading? Not just the image in the church, but friends, is Satan going to establish the image of the beast in the world? Is he, my friends? Revelation 13 confirms, but listen now, before Satan can move to establish the image of the beast in the world, we
we must see first bring the same sentiments of the image in the church. So once the church receive the spirit of the draconian image, then we will join in steps with Popery. I close. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Where are we going to, my friends? Beloved, I had no sleep last night. None. None. When God rest this thing upon my heart, I said, dear God, I would not sleep. Perhaps I won't wake up. <laughs> let, me, let me watch all night just to make certain I'm alive. Would you say amen? Because we need to hear this. And the devil was planning to allow some of us not to attend church today. 1 Corinthians 10 as we close. Notice in verse number 21. Are we there my friends? The Bible says, you cannot walk. Talk to me. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Verse 22, or else what will we do? We will provoke the Lord to jealousy. Let's examine ourselves now. So what condition, my brother, what condition, my sister, would cause us to bring jealousy in God's heart? Would cause us, would make us cause Jesus to be jealous? My friends, it's when we have a, a lukewarm experience. We partake of God's cup. We drink from God's cup. And then we leave church and drink of the devil's cup. Guess what? If that has, follow me, if that has been our experience, the image of jealousy is in our hearts. Satan's throne is in our hearts. It's time for us to pray sincerely. Dear God, break down every idol. Cast out every foe. Wash me that I shall be whiter than snow. We can be partaking of God's table and the devil's table. 2 Corinthians 6, Jesus says, Come out from among them and be how? Be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you unto myself. You shall be my sons and my daughters. And I shall be your God. That's what he says. How can I have power, pastor, to not have an in and out experience with God? Look at verse 16. The Bible says we must commune with him. Do what, friends? Verse 16 says, are we there? It says, uh, together, come on. The cup of blessing, which we bless. Is it not the, the, the what, friends? The communion of the blood of Christ. Uh, the bread which we break. Uh, is it not the what, friends? Uh, the communion of the body of Christ. So what will give us power? Just to drink from the cup of Christ. Just to eat from Christ's table. Just to commune with him and say no to Satan. We must abide. We must commune. Evening, morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud. In the book Ministry of Healing, Page 51 says, the Savior's life on earth was a life of communion with nature and with God. In this communion, Jesus has revealed for us the secret of the life of power. Where is the secret of power, friends? It's in communing with Jesus. Amen. Heads are about eyes are closed. Friends, do you just want a form of godliness without the power? Or do you want the form of godliness with the power? Then how can we get this power? It says, friends, the Savior's life on earth was a life of meditation, communion 
with his father. In this he has revealed to us, the what friends? The secret of what? The life of power. Father in heaven, who says today, dear God, I recommit my life to you? Is there one today?